All right, so th thank you everyone for, for coming to this talk. Um, so I'm, go I'm going to talk to you today about uh, trading, uh, in particular electronic low latency high frequency trading, um, and uh, make it, you know, in a, explain it in a way that's relevant to programmers. So it's a bit of a new kind of talk for me because I've been talking about C++ first time I, I, I get to talk about trading. Um, so why, what, what's the idea of this talk is, I've met a lot of uh, engineers which are a bit curious about what is uh, you know, high frequency trading, they hear about crazy sort of technology being developed uh, in that space. But finance has a, an image of being a little bit, uh, a little bit unapproachable and stuffy. You know, we think of people in suits in banks, not exactly you know, the uh, flip flops and shorts of the Silicon Valley startups. Uh, but the truth is, it's, it's very, uh, very tech driven uh, and even more so as, as time goes. So the, the goal is to tell you a little bit about this niche uh, and hopefully get you excited and uh, maybe uh, look into the, this industry. Um, there's all kinds of different C++ jobs uh, in trading. So traditionally, they are segmented uh, in three sort of categories. Even if things tend to, to change. Uh, so the, the colors are supposed to represent uh, how much C++ it is uh, because obviously you know, some of the parts you don't really have a need for or performance or, uh, or the other uh, specificities of C++. So traditionally, you have the front office are the people who actually trade. Um, the mid office are the people who uh, monitor uh, the people who are trading and, 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 uh, and support them. And then uh, the, the, the back office is really the, like, uh, the I guess, uh, the, the IT division, technology division, which are building the building blocks the front office are using. Uh, so what you see more and more is that uh, Everything is shifting towards the front office. Uh, in investment banks, they have special roles now that they call strats and stuff like that, where they will hire uh, C++ devs uh, directly into the front office. So some of the roles which are the most C++, I would think the number one is execution. Uh, so that's, that's what I do personally. So it's how do you place orders on the exchange uh, in the best possible way. Um, you have a low latency component to it, but there's also uh, some strategy aspect as well. Uh, connectivity, or you connect to which exchange you're going to trade on, which venue you're going to trade on, does have to be an exchange. Uh, and of course, uh, things to do with pricing, there are a bunch of numerical methods. So you could split it into, there's the modeling part, which is more academic, scientific approach to be, you know, pricing things. And then in the, in the front office, you will see people which are more on the monetization of that. So how do I you know, use uh, different models to... Uh, you know, find uh, an edge in the market and, and make money. So uh, who am I? Uh, just, uh, just to give you some context to so myself, I'm a C++ developer, uh, pretty much uh, very much a C++ guy. I've been a bit involved with the C++ Stars community for, for, for quite a few years. I used to work in HPC, uh, so high performance computing, uh, doing uh, parallel, uh, parallel programming, uh, GP, GPU, supercomputing. But my special, specialty was optimizing in, inside a single CPU. Uh, and of course, this uh, skill set that was trans translates well into, into trading, which I've been doing now for seven years. I work for uh, all kinds of different companies. Uh, specifically, market making is, is my experience, which is a specific type of, uh, of trading strategy. Uh, and now I work for Portofino. Uh, you see the Portofino logo everywhere, uh, where I, I work on execution connectivity. Uh, and latency uh, in general. So first, I mean, we, we're going to uh, see, I'm going to try to explain what is trading in a way that's you know, practical for, for developers. And we're going to see all the technology that we need to, to put in place uh, to do that in, in the best possible way. So uh, how do we connect to the different venues that we can trade? How do we model uh, the different uh, instruments and assets we're going to trade? Uh, how do we actually do the low latency execution and then there's a little part as well we discuss how do we actually do the data uh, science part of the, of the job, which I guess is more going to be more moving towards uh, outside of C++, but you still need to integrate it uh, with any, any trade C++ platform that you build. So um, first, what is, what is trading? So trading is just uh, uh, exchanging assets with someone else. Um, so uh, one way to, 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 the, uh, to specify the... the, the the way you, you exchange those assets is you have a, a pair as a base in the quotes, and you're going to trade, you know, Bitcoin for USD. So uh, 
you uh, you uh, acquire Bitcoin from someone and you give them USD. So that means you, you are buying Bitcoin, for example. Um, so the, the reason why you're, you're trading here, I mean, now we're talking is uh, you know, either you're doing an investment or you're speculating about the prices. Uh, you know, that's you know the, as as a as a business, this is this is the purpose of the uh, of the activity. Uh, and uh, there's all kinds of different assets that can be traded, and they all have they all ecosystem, they all set of they all set of players, and the different kind of uh, of platforms and details that are different. So uh, you got equities, which is I guess a more traditional investment product. You buy uh, stocks in a company. Uh, this related things, you have indices, which is like a benchmark of the best performing stocks in each country and each region. ETF, which is a fund that tries to follow a benchmark, which you can directly invest into. Uh, so the equities are specific. Uh, what's interesting is you get dividends by holding the equity. Um, fixed income, so you, got, uh, you get government bonds. So these are tends to be more, more stable because especially, especially the government bonds, uh, the government uh, is likely to, uh, uh, is, is a more, uh, less likely to default than, uh, than uh, than a company you invest in. Commodities, then you have the, the problem of storage. As, well, as soon as you, you, know, uh, if you buy uh, lots of uh, gallons of oil, you need to put them somewhere. So that's an interesting aspect that affects the price. And then currencies, you end up something which is entirely, uh, well, I guess equities as well are quite digital, like with paper. Uh, so currencies as well are, uh, are, are, are you don't have any, um, any storage concerns, uh, but they are extremely liquid because uh, they can used all over the world, everywhere. Uh, and cryptocurrencies, which is the new the new kid on the block. Uh, so cryptocurrencies, there's a blockchain, but there's also uh, traditional markets where you can trade cryptocurrencies, uh, which we have more likely. So it's very similar to uh, it's a mix of equities and currencies uh, in, in kind of behavior. So can you trade? Uh, uh, there's all kinds of different things you, you can trade. You don't have to trade the asset outright, which is called spot trading. Uh, usually, so, so if you need to trade with someone, I mean, you need to exchange the assets right now. So you, you, know, you want to buy uh, for Bitcoin with, with dollars, you need to have the dollars ready and you know, make the exchange. There's, uh, for that reason, there's all kinds of derivatives uh, where which allow you to um, uh, make a, an agreement, a contract uh, with the other party that you trade with. So you don't actually trade now. You, you agree to trade in three months, uh, and uh, it's essentially, you, it's, it's a bit like if you had a loan attached to, uh, to your purchase. Um, and there's a, we're gonna see in details what this means in terms of how we, we price those things. Uh, but that means that there is a, a different kinds of markets. There is the spot markets, the futures markets, the perpetual swaps, which is a, a new uh, crypto invention. And you have, uh, different uh, products, which are more like, specific to broker, the different broker platforms, like the contract for differences, CFDs, options. And this creates a real an universe of complex things which are mathematically related uh, and which you know, potential for arbitrage between them and you know, being listed in different venues. Uh, and uh, uh, when well, you need an automation to help you uh, deal with that. Um, so what, what, do, what do you trade? I mean, there's two different ways of making money. Simply, it's you have an opinion of the, the direction the price is going to move. Uh, because either you did uh, some fundamental analysis, you know this company, what product they're going to release. You know that, you know, you know that uh, AMD is releasing a new chip. Uh, they're going to they're going to go up. Uh, most likely, Intel is going to go down as a result. You, know, you you might have some fundamental analysis like this. You might just have something purely data driven, or you don't really know. Uh, there's some strategy. You don't need to have, uh, know what's going to happen in in, uh, in a few months. You just pay exactly. You are uh, ex uh, you're following the trends of the market. You are exploiting some of the dynamics of the market. You are um, connecting people between the enabling people to trade uh, by uh, you know buying in look in one location, selling in a different location. Uh, so that's another way uh, that you can uh, make revenue. Uh, so why is it electronic? Uh, so it, it's become uh, more and more electronic. In the past few years, some of the reasons are uh, for legal reasons. On, on equities, for example, it's regulated and it's easier if everything is electronic uh, for, to have a trace of why things were done to make sure there's no uh, insider trading or other things of that nature. Uh, and uh, as we get to more complex worlds uh, with more complex uh, trading instruments which are all connected and uh, globally distributed, uh, you know, we need uh, to automate things and, and uh, 
there's really a move towards uh, th doing things electronically. There's, there's still, you know, there's still some people who are doing the old-fashioned. Uh, they go to, a, I think it's called uh, the pit, uh, and some of the some of the markets, you know, you can raise your hand and say uh, you, uh, you 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 buy like this. But more and more, it's a, a platform that uh, you send uh, TCP packets to generally that you can interact with. Uh, so, uh, what kind of people are trading? Um, there's all kind of different entities. Uh, traditionally, they split into the buy side and the sell side. Uh, so, the buy side are people which are an investor that have an opinion on the future of the price. And, and the sell side is people which are already trying to do the connecting bit. Uh, so, you've got uh, uh, different, so you can, you can invest your own money. That's, usually, that's called a proprietary trading, trading firm. Or if you retail as a, as a, as a consumer. Or you can have asset under management uh, from uh, clients, which you then uh, put into the market. So typically, the proprietary trading firms, since they have more free, they don't have to clients to answer to. They're going to be more high tech because they can uh, they can more easily do uh, uh, do things um, more more free to to operate. And uh, so, in terms of the uh, sales side, uh, you've got uh, market makers which are there. They provide liquidity. That means that people that are constantly buying and selling. Uh, so wh what personally I do, uh, which means that um, it's a bit like uh, when you want to, uh, to change your uh, your uh, your pounds for dollars, uh, you know they uh, they, they will uh, they, someone that, which is always willing to, to do the exchange for you, but uh, they will uh, you know they 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 buy for uh, for less uh, than they sell and they, they make money from the difference, and what well, is all kind of different uh, services in that space as well, different entities. Um, so you, you, you can, you can uh, there's different kind of businesses, so um, well, I, uh, uh, you, can, uh, uh, directly, you can interact on the venue. That's, that's the most common thing. There is a big venue in exchange, which is connecting everybody. You can also uh, trade directly uh, with, um, with an entity if you build a link, a special relationship with them. Uh, you can also... Uh, execute on behalf. So, uh, so someone, you know, an investor might go to another company, ask them to use their technology platform or the algorithms to trade for them in, in a more efficient way, in a way that will allow them to get a better price. Uh, say someone, you know, investors wants to buy uh, uh, hundreds of millions within the next few months without affecting the market too much, because as you buy, it's going to going to raise the price. So they want to uh, be able to get the, the, the buy for the lowest possible price, so they will go to a company, please uh, uh, use your, your tech to give me the best price with an algo. And if you're, you're on exchange, so that's what we, we are going to talk about now, uh, we'll see exactly how that, that works. So uh, the, the most common type of air tra air trading on exchange is going to be continuous trading, which means that uh, as orders come in, they get matched with each other, and it's a bit of a speed game. Uh, so how uh, does it work? Talk about matching. Um, but before that, a bit of vocabulary. So, finance, like any industry, I guess, has a lot of jargon. Uh, so, I've listed some of it here. So, it's all about play, you know buying and selling. So, you place orders on the market. Uh, so, buy order is called the bid. A sell order is called an ask or an offer as well. Uh, I like to use ask because it's the same number of letters, yeah, lines, frankly. Uh, the side, as I mean, means that whether you're buying or selling. Uh, the tick is uh, also the, the price increment. So you're not allowed to, to buy, uh, sell at arbitrary prices. The market defines rules of, uh, you, know, you can only do every, every, uh, every 10 cents, for example, or every 50 cents in the example I have later. Um, and then uh, <coughs> you have at any point in time, I mean, we're going to see some example, uh, you have the, the, you, the, 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 the orders which are not matched with anyone, they stay in the market. And so the best buy order is going to be less than the, uh, the best sell order, because otherwise they would be matched with each other, they would trade, and they would disappear. Uh, and so the, the difference between those two is called the spread. Um, and uh, the touch is what we call the, the, this region. But I will explain with, with the diagram maybe later. Uh, it will be easier. Um, so here we're going to talk about continuous matching. That means that um, as uh, a market, uh, an order enters the market, uh, if it crosses another order, that means if the, 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 buy, the bid uh, is from a higher price than the best ask, it, it crosses it, and the ask is going to be executed, um, and if there's any remaining quantity, it might stay in the market. 
Uh, and so usually you have the, the passive orders in the market and you have someone placing a new order, initiating a trade. And we say that this is the aggressor uh, which is taking liquidity from, from the order book. Uh, there's all kinds of different variants of orders you can place. Uh, you can make it so that you can only take or you can only, only place passive orders. Uh, there's also a notion of icebergs where you can hide some of the quantity so that it doesn't leak through the, the public information. Uh, but let's look at an example. So here I've represented the main data structure that you would need in, in uh, electronic trading, which is called the order book. So uh, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very small one. And in practice, you know, you can have, uh, well, it depends on the market. You can have uh, uh, 10 to uh, 100,000 orders in, a, in an order book. Um, and it's uh, moving uh, very fast, uh, very quickly. Um, you know, you can have a change to the order book every, uh, every, uh, every 100 microseconds uh, continuously throughout the day. So this example here, so the, the red is uh, the, the sell orders. So uh, I, I have uh, arranged them by price. So we can see that uh, at the price of 11.50, there's only one order to sell. At the price of 12, there are two orders to sell, one of 15, one of 20. Uh, the tick here, the price increment is 50 cents. That means that uh, it's quite, it could also be dynamic, but here is a fixed tick, uh, tick size. So uh, we have a price of 11, which would be a valid price, but there's no, no order placed there. Um, and the, uh, the, they were arranged by the, the, the time um, at which they entered the book. So they, this, that would be the, the priority, so kind of a, a queue system, FIFO. So uh, if you are looking at that, uh, this, this is price of 12, so 15 uh, was inserted before into the book, so it would, it would be executed before uh, 20, so it would be you would trade before, before 20. So we're going to see a few scenarios of all these changes. So let's say I'm placing now a buy order at uh, 1050, at uh, so a price of 1050 of 20 lots, 20 quantities, whatever that, that means for that particular uh, particular instrument that we, we are trading. So what I mean is I just joined the queue. Uh, so my 20 is added to the, to the queue. And uh, I would only get executed if uh, 6 and 10 get executed first. Um, another option is I could place the same order of 20 lots, but at 11. Uh, then what that means is that I establish a new price level and I'm at the front. So I'm currently, I am the best order to buy. So if someone came in to sell, uh, I would be the, 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 the best, the, the one to be, uh, to be executed first. Uh, of course, I had to sacrifice. Uh, now I'm buying for higher price, so I, I, you know, I make less, less profit, potentially. Another option is now I'm going to buy uh, 20 at 11.50. 11 so what happens is I get matched against the 10 that was there. Right? So there is a trade that, uh, of uh, 10 lots at 11.50. The sell order that was there disappears, but I still have 10 lots of my order which were unmatched. And they stay, they stay in, the, in the order book, so they, now they, they join. And what we see that was this logic, you say that the market has, has ticked up because the, uh, what used to be uh, a sell level now is a, is a buy level. And uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the price is essentially the price of the instrument is, is going up now. Uh, uh, people are, yeah, likely people are going to follow and, and uh, the, the, the fair price before you would say that the middle is 11. Now you say, well, now this thing is more like worse, you know, 11.75, right? So, because this is sort of the, the, the meeting point between the buyers and the sellers. Um, another case, say, no, I, 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 so back to the initial states there. So we, we had the sell orders at 11.50 and 12, and now I buy at, at 12. So what happens is, uh, first, I execute everything that was at 11.50, because that, that's, uh, that is... Um, uh, better than the price I'm asking for. So I'm willing to buy at up to 12. So that means that 11.50 is a good price for me to, to trade at. So I trade 10 lots at 11.50, that's the order disappears. I sell again, 10, uh, I trade against, uh, again, 10 lots at 12, I get mashed until I get that 15 lot order. Uh, and there is five lots uh, remaining. And uh, the spread has widened, so it's kind of a, an opportunity for, uh, for people to decide if the, the market should recontract or not. Uh, and says the order is partially filled, it's still uh, in the market. Um, and then, so here we were to, look, to looking in the case of uh, uh, FIFO matching, like a, a queue. 
uh, some, some markets to try to make things uh, to be more fair for, for participants or to uh, uh, is it simply experiment with different matching logic. So in some markets instead, what you could happen is that um, people get filled pro rata. Uh, so it's the case, for example, I know of uh, uh, for treasury bonds, US treasury bonds, uh, they, uh, at least on the options, they have a mechanism like that. Um, and you get, uh, since um, uh, the, the total quantity uh, here was, uh, was uh, 35, uh, and so you have, uh, I guess, uh, 40, 60 percent, and uh, the, the 60, 40 percent goes to one, one order, 60 percent goes to the other one, and the, 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 the placement in the queue wouldn't matter uh, for that case. So yeah, the, the matching algorithm is very important in terms of the, 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 the strategy you're going to build and the software you need to deploy for that. Uh, so what does it mean in terms of, uh, of code? Uh, so we have this order book data structure that we need to maintain. You need to um, orders, get, uh, you get messages that add order, modify order, cancel orders. You need to be able to look up the order by, by its ID. You have some kind of hash table. Uh, you need to also arrange the orders per price level. So uh, I mean, there's different ways. I mean, you could have a self-balanced binary tree. There's also uh, other techniques you, you could use, uh, especially yeah, for the close to the touch, you might want to use uh, a circular buffer. And then only as you get far, you would move to a self-balancing binary tree to try to make things more cash efficient. Uh, and then you're going to have a list of orders per, for, per level. Uh, so yeah, we, we're talking about making things very low latency here. So even this, you, this simple data structure, uh, needs to be very efficient. Uh, so we want to, everything to be pre-allocated and pooled. We don't want to have any allocations where order comes in and out. Um, I find it very useful to use intrusive data structures. So for example, boost intrusive is uh, one example of that, which allows you to have one object, which is part of multiple, uh, multiple collections. Uh, and then um, you can have, a, a, in terms of hashing, there's all kinds of different uh, things going on. Uh, you know, there's all, all different types of open addressing, uh, hashing tables. Uh, I think Robin Hood hashing is currently the, the most the famous uh, uh, technique for, uh, for open addressing. Uh, and uh, you could also optimize it for if you, you're going you're gonna to look up by the client order ID, uh, the, the, or the, rather than the client order ID, the, the exchange order ID of uh, all of your orders coming in and out. And if you know the distribution of those IDs, you can also optimize your, your hashing further. Um, so we're going to look at what, what, what could be a, a strategy based on what we saw to, to, to make money. Uh, so what, what are the conclusions from uh, what we saw about matching is you have two options. Uh, either you can try to, uh, to trigger a trade, or you can place an order and wait until someone comes in and triggers the trade. So if you are uh, active, you are... Um, the one triggering, you are the aggressor. Uh, you can trade instantly, but you, you trade for a uh, for higher price, uh, for a worse price. Uh, and uh, if you trade uh, passively, you can potentially get a better price, but you don't get to choose uh, when you trade. And there's a risk that uh, potentially the market moves away from you and you, you never trade at all. Um, so uh, uh, basically, when you build a strategy, one thing which is interesting to, to consider, if you, what is the probability of my passive orders being executed, uh, which is going to take uh, you know, be a, a factor of uh, how do I get the execution at the best possible price. And so you can improve the probability, as we saw, by increasing, by creating a new level if, if the spread is wide enough. Uh, but that worsens the, the final price that you're going to get. Uh, so if you are market making, uh, the strategy is essentially, at least uh, pure market making, is to capture the spread, capture this difference between uh, the best, uh, the best uh, bid and the best task. Because uh, you're constantly buying and selling both sides. And the hope is, uh, you know, you're, 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 someone sells and so you match it with your buy order. And then someone later on buys and it matches with your sell order. And uh, if the market has not moved in between, well, you've captured the difference between those two, and that's profit. Of course, markets change, and the uh, you know, market is going to move before uh, potentially uh, you are able to close your position. But it's really uh, a strategy where it's you move in and out, right? So uh, if uh, if you're bought, that means you are uh, position you're long. You will try to sell to go back 
in being at zero. Um, and uh, you will, uh, will bias, essentially, your, your systems towards always going back to zero. Uh, but it's a strategy which doesn't need to make a, a assumptions about trends uh, in the price. You just basically follow the, the structure of the book. Uh, but you need to be very quick to react. Then if you're more asset management, what you try to build is alpha, which is uh, your predictor of uh, where the market's going to go. So if you believe the market will go up, you buy before it goes up. And then when it has gone up, you can sell and look in the profits. Or you can do the other way around. So if you believe the market will go down, you can sell. So a lot, a lot number of firms uh, will not go sh short uh, by, by policy, the traditional firms so they will not sell something that they don't have. Um, but I guess the more hedge funds, uh, more uh, sophisticated will do that. So using uh, the different derivatives, like futures, where you enter into a, a contract, so you can, you can sell things you don't actually have because you actually it's on a loan or something like that. Um, and then so if, you're doing, if you're doing asset management, the main strategy is going to be you have a portfolio of assets. Uh, you're going to look at what are the, the optimal set of trades you can make to maximize the value of your portfolio. Uh, and then it's uh, a matter of uh, making those trades happen uh, uh, while minimizing the, the slippage between what you, you, know, you would have liked to get to, uh, but, and that what you do get. So it's less of a, you could have a system where you only, you know, uh, overnight, you make your portfolio optimization. You need to make some trades happen during the day. While if you're doing market making, it's really, really, you're constantly uh, trading, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of times per day. Uh, of course, the, the, the reality is that, uh, if you're building a trading strategy, this component of, of both of these things. Uh, so if your market making is a platform to build a, to build a efficient execution, uh, your goal is always to, um, uh, if, if, if you are doing, um, as we saw that with you, you, are, uh, you try to enter into a position because you have alpha and you think that this position is going to realize it, uh, into profit, uh, you, you want to enter this position most efficiently, minimize the market impact. So as you buy, you don't want to make the market go up. Uh, you want to minimize the slippage. You have uh, managed to get the price which is in line with uh, with your uh, with your simulations, and uh, having a bit of alpha will help you as well uh, in uh, especially short term alpha. If you're constantly uh, quoting, so if you're uh, quoting, so constantly placing orders, the risk is everything is correlated. So, uh, for example, if you say you're doing equities, the thing which is leading all equities is the S and P index in the U.S. So if the S and P index uh, suddenly goes down. Uh, is going to most likely affect all equities worldwide. You need to be very quick to ingest information and adjust your prices in the market because otherwise uh, people are going to come in and take your orders and you're going to make bad trades. Uh, so you need uh, some kind of, uh, of short-term alpha uh, if you're going to be a market maker. Uh, so now we're going to see how that works in terms of uh, the technology to connect to, the, to, this, to these venues and platforms. Uh, so what happens is you, you have one central place, place if you're you know, doing, of course, if you're doing blockchain, this works uh, quite differently. But if you're traditional trading, you have one exchange uh, where every participant connects to, uh, and a participant is going to have a private connection and a, uh, and a public connection. So in the private connection, you authenticate and you place your orders. The exchange tells you, when uh, your orders have been changed or because they have matched against someone and you have a trade. Uh, and it will also publish everything on the public feed, uh, which is anonymized usually, uh, and which contains all of the orders of all the participants. So you have your own private feed, uh, and you have this uh, public feed, which is usually the same for everyone. So in terms of technology, you might already think, you know, what's the best way uh, to have the same data uh, distributed to everybody? Uh, so um, the, 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 com the most common setup is to use a uh, multicast. Uh, so if you, everybody is on the same subnet, uh, because traditionally what happens is uh, all the participants are in the same room, in the same data center. They have the same length of cable to the exchange, and uh, the exchange tries to give the data to everyone at the same time. And so uh, multicast UDP is going to be the best way uh, to achieve that. And so you're going to have your multicast for the public data, and you're going to have TCP for your private uh, link to place orders. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of the traditional setup. But then um, more and more exchanges now are also moving to the cloud. And uh, so there is more like internet and web technology. And so everything is going to be with TCP. 
uh, which of course causes some uh, capacity problems and also some, uh, some fairness problems uh, that you can exploit or not uh, to your benefit. Um, but logically, it tries to do the same thing, right? You have a, a private and a public key. Um, if you also want to be, to be able to act on the, uh, on the exchange as quickly as possible, you need to understand the whole topology of the network. So uh, on the on the on the on the uh, I guess yeah like this um, on the exchange side you have the order gateways which is where you place your orders and it goes into the matching engine which is what uh, matches buyers with sellers and then it's going to go to the market data publisher which publishes the data to all participants uh, and all of their the exchange components are going to be interconnected internally with their own switches and that's you know, their network and. On the other side, every participant has his own network. So as I said, the, the typical setup is you, you run in the same room uh, in, a, in the data center uh, with the same length of cable, but so you, they bring to you a, a patch panel in the cabinets, and after that, uh, you do uh, whatever you want. Uh, and uh, you're going to most likely have a switch uh, because you have multiple devices that you need to interconnect. Uh, and the cable that they give you, the line that you, you, you purchase from uh, to connect to the exchange, is going to go through uh, some kind of access layer. Uh, and um, it's, it, it can be useful to understand exactly uh, how it's set up, because if there are multiple uh, switches at the access layer, they, maybe some of them are under more contention than others. And so maybe some, uh, you know, uh, if you have uh, 10, uh, 10 gigabit links coming in and one coming out, if they all send data at the same time, there's no magic. They need to be queued for, for this to happen. And if you are always on the switch, which is uh, with the most contention, you're always going to be systematically slower than other participants. So it's good to do research to make sure that you can, uh, you can get the fastest access possible. Maybe you also need to use both gateways, only to identify the best, the fastest gateway. Um, it might be useful to know the type of switches that they use. So uh, you're sending uh, TCP packets, so they're IP packets, which are uh, Ethernet packets. Uh, and well, well, this is the way the, the, the layers are stacked. And um, the way Ethernet packets work is that at the end of the Ethernet packet, there is a checksum. And so traditionally, you switch, uh, the packet comes in, it waits until the end, it validates it, and then uh, carries it over to the rest of the network. So that's the store and forward uh, logic. Um, but that means that depending on the size of the frame, of the Ethernet frame, you're going to be potentially advantaged uh, because if small frames are going to go faster through the switch than large frames, you could exploit that by uh, having small frames. And on the on the other side, if they have uh, cut through switches, we just uh, send whatever uh, you know whatever's on the wire without any checks. Then it doesn't matter how, how, how big it is, and then you can also use that to your advantage by you know sending the maximum size every time, which allows you to do certain tricks. Um, so that's that. So as I mentioned, uh, the multicast. Uh, so the approach to multicast is, you know, uh, if you need to send the data to many participants, with multicast, you send it once, and then it gets replicated by the network, by the, the, the switching uh, infrastructure. So you don't need to you know, send the data multiple times. But if you use unicast, uh, you actually need to send the data for every single participant. So it's a lot more wasteful. And so that means that uh, for all exchanges where they would use unicast, uh, they have problems with bandwidth, and so they might need to coalesce the data, they might need to throttle the data, um, and you can't guarantee that people get it at the same time, because what literally happens is, uh, you know, they, they need to send the, the, you know, an order was led to the order book, there is 10,000 people that need to know about it, and you need to send one by one uh, to everyone. And depending on where you are in the list, you're going to get it before or not. So it's also, that means you, you might need to build software to, to game for that. Um, so protocol considerations. So as I mentioned, the, the, the data you might get might be netted, might be throttled, might be coalesced. Um, so I mean, coalesced, I mean that instead of getting every independent updates, you get uh, only the, 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 the final states at different uh, sampling. Uh, you know, it's, say it's sampled every 100 milliseconds, you will only get uh, the, the, the state there and not the intermediates. And you usually have different uh, fidelity. So, they might just give you the best, uh, the best bid and ask. They might give you all of the orders, which is called the level three order book, which is uh, the best. You know, if you're building a uh, shift strategy, that's great because you have exactly visibility on uh, what's happening. Or they might just give you aggregated quantity per level. Um, 
And then in terms of, of uh, complexity, coding this sort of stuff, the main complexity is usually that, well, especially if you work with a multicast, since it's the same feed sent to everybody, uh, CUDP, you can lose packets. Uh, the packets can come out of order. Uh, and you join a stream you know, that starts maybe in the beginning of the day, at midnight or at 8 a.m., depending on the, uh, on the platform. And you need to find a, find a way, because it's incremental updates. It will tell you, ah, oh, this order has been added. This order has been removed. And you need to have a, uh, at least a snapshot, or you need to recover all of the previous updates. So you need to synchronize uh, this sort of things. There's usually uh, different load protocols to deal with this. In terms of uh, what does it use in terms of serialization? What kind of messages do we have? Uh, everything is designed uh, on, on, uh, on the more traditional exchanges. I mean, the, I think the fastest exchange in, in Europe is going to be uh, uh, the Dutch and Berkshire exchanges, uh, Eurex, Zitra. Uh, they tend to have built technology which is really built for speed and they are fully deterministic. And they would use uh, basically messages which are uh, you with the packet, you can just reinterpret it and you have the structure and memory. There's no decoding to be done. Uh, another uh, thing with SBE works in that in, in that vein as well. Uh, it's uh, um, a, like a, a meta uh, uh, meta language to describe uh, message protocols. Then another one was uh, in, in the past was quite popular. Something was called FAST. Uh, it wasn't that fast, but it's called FAST, and it's a delta encoding. So it's designed to to compress the data a bit further by not not um, uh, only telling you the, the fields which have changed. Uh, instead of repeating everything, but that's uh, kind of uh, not as popular anymore. So that's for the, the binary formats that are really designed to, for things to be, to be fast. And then you have a lot of text formats, uh, which are a very inefficient way of, of, uh, of transporting a large amount of information, but are still somehow very common. I guess it's also part of making it, making the platform accessible, especially if you, know, if you look at crypto, cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, I think one of the main uh, evolution there is that they make trading accessible to, to everyone. And so uh, the web-based, uh, you know, uh, REST, WebSocket, JSON, this kind of, this kind of tech. Uh, another text protocol is FIX, which is a key value pairs. So it's literally it's text is a key equal value, uh, special character, which is uh, the, the byte one. Uh, as a um, and then, um, so as I said, they, 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 they will send you, uh, some of them will use UDP. Uh, so UDP packets, uh, uh, they they uh, will have a uh, uh, constraint by the MTU. So MTU on the internet and most networks is 1,500. Uh, so that means that gives a limit on the payload of the UDP packet. And so uh, the nice exchanges will make sure that you never get fragmented data because the largest message size is less than the MTU. Uh, some of them uh, don't care, especially if it's uh, TCP based. Uh, you know, they say, well, just do whatever TCP says to get the, the payload. It's not really uh, datagram based. Uh, so one important concern as well is decimal numbers. So when you're trading, uh, you're, uh, you're usually going to be trading in decimal numbers. You can trade uh, some of those things. They will have a tick of one cent. It's, you know, it's not uncommon. And you need these things to be exact, right? Uh, you can't afford, uh, you know, to... Uh, be you know uh, have a, a little rounding error and uh, because they could add up and, and be very significant, especially because some of these strategies are really about making uh, you know making money on one one hundred or one one thousandth of the of the price, right? So this needs to be to be to be correct. And um, so some people use floating point, normal floating point, binary floating point, uh, but uh, that's uh, uh, well at least for, for trading systems. Um, that's often a source of problems. Uh, you sometimes not realize that 0 0.1 cannot be exactly represented uh, as, as a binary floating point, but you can exactly represent it as, as decimal floating point. Um, so the difference between the binary floating point is that you represent numbers as a multi sign in an exponent, and it's uh, 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 2 to the power of that exponent. And so if you decimal floating point, it's 10 to the power of that uh, exponent. Uh, so the decimal floating point, I know there was, there was uh, uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, there were proposals to integrate it into C++. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, this, it's not pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's not some topic that's being discussed much anymore. Uh, it remains somewhat uh, esoteric. Um, but the idea yeah, would have been a, a solution uh, for finance applications. Uh, in, in practice, what most exchanges uh, do, they work with integers. 
scale the integers, they give you the scale. Uh, so decimal uh, fixed points. That means you, you, do, you do not have a normalized, uh, uh, normalized uh, value that you would get. Uh, you don't have a norm, because if, if you are with decimal floating points, the, the, the mortisa is always between one and 10. So that wouldn't be the case, uh, the case with, uh, with scale values. Just this, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an integer and you know that it is uh, uh, one to the power of uh, nine times uh, bigger than the actual value that you are feeling. Um, but this is, this is a fairly straightforward to work with. And I think that's uh, kind of what uh, uh, most people are, are using. You just have uh, scale integers. You need to keep track of the scale, make sure you don't uh, mix up the scales and similar. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of coding, I mean, if you're in C++, of course, you know, you can use templates and say, uh, my, my, uh, my scale is compile time, and so this way you can protect yourself against uh, uh, against overflows or other risky risky behaviors. Um, yeah, so as I said, the exchanges they tend to use scale integers. Uh, in the fast protocol, I think there is, there is provision for a decimal floating point, uh, but that's that's a bit rare now. Uh, I would recommend uh, to uh, work with integers, exact integers. So most of your computation need to be exact. And then uh, he, as part of a trading system, there's some of it is more like modeling and numerical, and then you would switch to double and be careful uh, when you do these this conversions. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we, we price things. And what's interesting is, is that helps us build, uh, figure out at, uh, what, at what prices we're going to buy and sell. And then uh, after that, we probably talk about you know, more, more uh, you know, software architecture techie subjects. Um, a bit more vocabulary. Uh, so usually what, what the way you, you trade things is that you build a theoretical model of uh, what is the price of an instrument, you call that a, a CO. And then um, things you're going to measure is, is the edge, which is what's the difference between, uh, between the, the CO and a given price at which you can, you can trade. And your goal is, of course, is to capture the most amount of, of edge. Um, and so credit is a minimum edge that you're going to require when you place your orders. Uh, and uh, there's things to, to, to evaluate uh, the quality of your pricing. Uh, so the, you look at markouts. Markouts, you're going to look at how uh, the difference between your CO and, um, and the price uh, that for every trade. You're going to look in the future at different time horizons. And you're going to see um, uh, whether or not uh, the the, you, you lost money uh, after five minutes. Uh, you know, say you lost. Did you lose money? Did you did the trade have edge at the time of the of the trade? Did it have? Uh, did it still have edge a bit later on in the future and all that? Um, then so some of, some of those, those pricing models they're gonna have parameters, and you can use the uh, the, the derivative of the, of the of the model related to these parameters to decompose. This, uh, this edge into Greeks. Um, they're all de just derivatives. Uh, they, they, they call them Greeks because I guess they all have Greek letters usually. Uh, and then you, one way, if, if, if you could, uh, if you collect uh, edge somewhere, um, this edge you know, is only maybe valid for some amount of time. So what you might decide to do is to just hedge it. So as a French person with French with H, it was always a, a challenge to, to correctly uh, make myself understood. But, uh, yeah, so if you, if you hedge with an H, uh, that means that you are covering, uh, doing a trade for the purpose of blocking it profit that you made somewhere else. <coughs> so uh, how do you get the price? Uh, one way is uh, the most, uh, I guess, most real way is to look at the book. So uh, is it called uh, the macro structure, which is oh, are orders placed? Is there like a pressure to buy, pressure to sell? Um, what is the current state right now? What has been the state in the past? How, uh, you know, is, there, is there a trend? Are there some momentums? Uh, you know, can you try to predict from that which way the, 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 the book is going to go? Uh, so usually you would build a bunch of features like this. Uh, so you've hand, handwritten features uh, that you most likely you're, you're going to fit in some model uh, to find out which one are significant and uh, what's the right ratios. Um, and uh, Tick size of the market is going to have a huge impact on the, the dynamics of the order book. So if you have a very large tick size, uh, for example, I know I used to trade the, uh, 
uh, Eurostox Future, uh, which is an index, European index of uh, equity index. Uh, and uh, it's very, very large uh, tick size, or at least it had uh, back then. And so the, it was always one tick wide. It was always, you know, there's a lot of liquidity on both sides. It's very thick. And you don't really need to care too much. I mean, at least uh, you, could, you could make a reasonable trading system just looking at the BBO uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, do, looking at the imbalance of liquidity on the sides. But if you are a market which is a smaller tick, which you would think in, in, in principle is better because it enables people to get uh, to execute at finer prices, is better. Yes? So the tick size is a minimum price increment at which you can place orders. Uh, and so that's going to be uh, the incompressible difference between the best buy and the best sell. Uh, and so the smaller it is, I guess the finer, uh, you know, the, the more people can really get uh, the closer to the, the real uh, the real price. Uh, but so if, if, it, if it's uh, too small, what you have is that you have a very a market which is quite spread uh, and uh, that it's, it's more difficult to uh, price it correctly. So exchanges they usually try to find a, a balance where there is, a, uh, there is an incentive for people to improve the price and, and uh, place on different levels. But at the same time, you want it to be easy for investors to execute in the market. Uh, so just very simple BBO models. In practice, of course, uh, people use much more sophisticated things, but it's just an idea where the way you can uh, model the, the fair price is you can look at the mid. So what's the average between the, bid, uh, the ask price and the bid price? The better one is you can look at the reverse weighted sum. So you look at the quantity as well, you take into account the quantity that is on, on each of those levels, meaning that the, the less uh, quantity there is, the more likely this price is to disappear. So it's going to, it's going to, uh, the, 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 because the, the liquidity is going to push the price away uh, uh, towards the other side. So these models, they have a lot of problems. Uh, you need, in practice, you need to do more sophisticated things uh, because as soon as uh, the, the, the BBO changes, uh, they're going to be very noisy uh, and potentially you know, make you, you know, as the, the, the one level disappears, the level behind has lots of liquidity, which is meaningless, which is pushes you against in the wrong direction. So, um, they, they are, but that's an, an example of model. So in, in practice, you will do that with full depths. You can look at order, all the order is. You can look at, um, uh, so you, of course, the depths as far as, as, uh, as you get far away, it's got less weight. Uh, you use different models where you, you can have even uh, optimizations uh, uh, involved to, to find uh, imbalance points. There's all kinds of, uh, different models there and people come up with. Just to give you an idea of the flavor of what, what people do there. Uh, but you can also look at the momentum, predict the future. Of course, predicting the future is always you know, the silver bullet. If you know what's going to happen, uh, that's great. Um, and uh, you try to, but if, if, when you're doing uh, this sort of thing, you really try to, to find the earliest possible signals. So you can just be even, the, just the previous packet actually add some information that could have, uh, the way the exchange delivers the information, the, it was actually uh, the size of the packet, uh, the, the way it was laid out in, in UDP, uh, UDP um, datagrams could tell you uh, the nature of what's going on potentially a little bit earlier than if you, you know, interpret the data naively. Uh, another way you can price things is by just going, looking at statistical correlations. So if you, uh, if you see here, I took this example, uh, Intel AMD. Every time AMD goes up, Intel goes down. So uh, you can just react. You see, well, uh, AMD uh, just went up. Uh, I know uh, uh, Intel is going to go down. Uh, I'm going to sell right now. <coughs> um, so you, you, you will want to take into account those things as well. Uh, uh, which, of course, the problem is that you have an explosion because usually you have a very large universe of tradables. Everything is correlated. So it's a big work to just uh, figure out the right correlations between everything. And then you have derivatives. Uh, so I mean, just looking at an overview to, 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 to go to the point that you have a lot of sources to figure out what the price of something is. Uh, so one way you can, uh, it's a derivative. So the, the, the futures that we mentioned earlier, uh, the future is a, um, is a contract that you enter uh, to uh, buy something at the, at the time in the future. And so the time, the price of the future is the price of the underlying thing, which is the S here in the formula, the spot, plus the, the cost of time. And the cost of time is uh, based by the uh, interest rates 
uh, of uh, because uh, you, you you actually you you need to borrow the, the thing, uh, you need to borrow the, the money. Uh, so you also in, in AI have modeled it a very simple formula, which is with continuous compound, compounding. But in practice, uh, interest rates are actually quite discrete because they per day, per business day. You can also have discrete cash flows because if it's an equity, equities, it pays dividends at certain dates. Uh, if it's commodities, you have storage costs that you, you also need to take into account for. Um, so uh, you, 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 this is, in the, you need as well to know what is the rate at which people can borrow. And everyone can borrow at different rates. So you know the, the rate of the bank, the official rate uh, of uh, you know, the, the Bank of England, or the, 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 the European Central Bank. But you don't know the, the special rates that other participants might have negotiated. So uh, it, you can also decide to infer the rate uh, what is this rate based on the prices you observe in the market? So you observe people are buying and selling the future at a certain price. You observe they're buying and selling the spot at a certain price. And based on the difference, you can say, well, that must mean the rate is this. Uh, you can do it as well across different expiries. So you have you know, the future in three months, six months, nine months. Um, so that's, uh, that's for futures. Then you can, you know, there's all kind of, uh, you can up the ante, there's all kind of complicated uh, instruments that can be traded. And there are options. So an option, you can buy or sell something at a fixed price at a time in the future. And uh, you can decide or not if you exercise it at, at this time. So there's European options, which have nothing to do with the fact that they are in Europe. It's just uh, the exercise style. So European options, they mean that uh, you can only exercise or not at maturity at the time of the expiry. And so you, because there is probability or not that the price is going to move toward that fixed price, uh, you have uh, uh, this more probabilistic uh, method. So N is a, a normal cumulative, um, uh, cumulative the different, uh, the distribution function. Uh, and you, have, you still have this uh, time component with the, uh, the discount factor of rates, uh, exponential R T minus T. Uh, but you also have uh, sigma, which is what we call the volatility. Uh, and so if you're trading option, options are a lot about Volatility trading, modeling the volatility. And you, the volatility is usually seen as a, a free variable that you need to figure out as well. So it's, uh, uh, you need to look at the prices of the options and figure out what the volatility is from them. And what you're going to do usually is you're going to have a model uh, because you know that the volatility across the different prices, or they call the strikes, because you have, up to, you have for a given underlying, you have thousands of options at different fixed prices. And you know they're all supposed to be quite smooth and related. So you're going to build a model that defines all they are related with certain degrees of freedom, and you're going to fit your parameters until you do that. So that's also a good use case for C++ because it's quite numerically intensive. You're going to do a fitting. You can do you know, a, a gradient descent type methods, a levenberg markart other kind of optimizers uh, to figure that out. I guess you could also use uh, more like uh, robotics approaches, like uh, cabin filters or that, to figure out uh, those, uh, those inputs. Uh, and then, uh, so people will reason about the different Greeks here, which are the sensitivity of the price of those options relative to uh, their various inputs. So delta is the sensitivity to the underlying, to S. Giga is the uh, sensitivity to sigma, the relativity. And you have the time and the rate. So that's for the European option, American options. Uh, yeah, now you need to solve a PDE. There's no closed formula. So American options are options which can be exercised at any time until expiry. So here you need to use a PDE. Uh, you need to solve a PD. And so that means uh, that that's very properly uh, uh, numerically intensive. And this kind of thing, you know, remember, you, you need to be able to do them very quickly. Uh, ideally, you know, if you can update your prices, and you have a universe of a million different instruments that you need to reprice every millisecond. Uh, so you will need to, uh, to build a, a fast solver. Uh, I guess it's Kronk Nicholson, this kind of method you would use uh, to solve this, uh, this PD. Uh, so what we saw here is that for a given uh, instrument, you have plenty of different sources of pricing. So if I just take a future, I could price a future from the spot. Um, and, and, and then uh, I could also price the future. Uh, so I, I have so the spot, I, I have my macro price system. I infer from the order book system. And then I, from that, I know also have the rates that I figure out one way or another. And I price the future from that. Or I could do it the other way around. I could uh, usually... What actually happened is that the derivatives are much more liquid because uh, you can trade them without actually owning the, the thing. So they're going to be uh, the one leading the market. 
Uh, and then you might need to, uh, to blend the two uh, because basically the price dynamics uh, and there's uh, you know, potential for arbitrage, but because there's a few variables that you don't really know about, there's a bit of uncertainty. Uh, it's something you, know, you need to be quite uh, careful of. So there's a lot of, of modeling there, of uncertainty. There's, uh, you you uh, insert, uh, you know, because you fit models, but they never quite fit with the market. You need to understand why there is always a residual. Is it a problem in your model? Is it just that the, the market is persistently different? Uh, so that's part of, the, of, uh, of working uh, in a trading system. So now we're going to talk about uh, exec uh, low latency execution. So why do we need to be fast? Uh, so we have markets with many participants. All the time, there's a stream of orders being added, removed. Uh, so the, 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 the exchange is always under load. So there is always a delay between what you receive from the exchange and the, the order that you're sending. Because uh, you know, even if yourself, your system can be very fast, you know that since there are so many participants acting on the same market, it might take you milliseconds, tens of milliseconds before uh, the exchange can process the order you have in flight and act on it. And um, you always, uh, you, you, you send uh, to, uh, to an order gateway, you, you kind of join the queue. Uh, there's a lot of queuing of, 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 your, of the, your transactions before they, they get to be processed. It's all a very asynchronous system. Then you have the problem of fairness, which is, uh, you know, as I say, if the exchange is not uh, multicast based, people will not have the data at the same time. Uh, then there's a lot of exchanges with preferential access. You know, if you pay extra, or if you have a special status, you get faster data, you get better data. Uh, so that's uh, you know makes things a bit unfair. Um, yeah. So because you have multiple entry points, some might be more contentious. So you some some might be uh, some might be faster or slower. So some markets are experimenting with different rules to try to. Uh, to make speed less of a problem. Uh, so uh, pro data matching, for example, is one of those rules because you, the, 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 the placement of your order doesn't really matter anymore. So even if you're slow to place your order, you'll still get the good trades. Um, but there's also things like asymmetric delay. So the, I know on Urex, it's what, what they call it passive liquidity protection, which means that the aggressor is delayed always, which gives more time to people uh, which are uh, a passive liquidity, passive orders to amend the orders if they want to. And some, some, some exchanges are deterministic. Uh, I guess, well, if you, if you embrace really the, you want things to be fair, you, oh, things are always the same, you document things very quickly, everybody has the same length of cable. What it leads to is that people end up doing FPGAs and they do ASICs and then you know, they, uh, they do crazy tech because uh, if it's deterministic, the fastest guy always wins. So you just want to be the fastest. And some, uh, some venues explicitly go, with, uh, we don't want things to be deterministic. We like things to be a bit random, which is convenient because uh, from a technology point of view, it's difficult to make things deterministic. Uh, and then that means that you have, you have a lot as well of tricks. You know, people will find secrets, secret way to exploit and to get an edge. Uh, so both approaches, whatever, uh, whichever one you take, is bound to have some, some problems. So the, 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 the problem that you have as a market maker, which is placing orders in the market, is you can get picked off. So what we say picked off is you have an order which is going to trade at a price you didn't want. So the, the, the multiple reasons for that, uh, as I said, for example, you know, the some other instrument uh, somewhere else uh, has moved, uh, which is driving the price. Or it's even more uh, clear, I guess, if you do... Uh, uh, the options are going to be very linked to the price of the underlying. The underlying moves that change the price of a lot of the options. Uh, and if you're too slow to modify all of your orders, you're going to trade at bad prices. Um, there's also a reason why you can trade at bad prices, maybe because uh, you're placing, you're, you're, you're trading everywhere. And as a market maker, basically, whenever you trade, you want to readjust uh, all of your own orders to get out of that trade. And you want to not be pushed into too big of a position. You don't want to buy too much, right? You want to buy a little bit, sell it on. Uh, and if you get pushed into buying too much or selling too much, that's going to be difficult to get out of, and maybe you will not be able to get out of it fast enough. <clears throat> so uh, you want where to achieve good priority. Uh, so if you have bad priority, if you're, if you're always at the end of the, of, of the queue, you're never going to get to trade when you join a passive order. Um, so there's a few opportunities where you can, you can 
uh, uh, whenever the, there's enough space in, in the spread to, 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 place, uh, to place orders, uh, you can also proactively place orders uh, to achieve good priority. Uh, so what happens as well is that everyone wants the good stuff. So you would see that if you, uh, if you have a, a, a system, for example, which you see is, is managing to do a lot of the trade is trying to do, um, maybe it's because they're not actually good trade and no one else is trying to do them. So whenever you, you, you really try to go for the, the, the juicy trades, you will find that that's where the competition is and where you will miss most of them. Um, well, yeah, we are here, that's more like, yeah, the, the events in which there are some particular events uh, where you want to be very fast. So, uh, so that, yeah, if, you, if, you're building, if you're doing a taking strategy, for example, so as we said before, when you, you, you consider about being picked up, this is a bit the other side. Uh, so if uh, you, see, you, you see the, you see the, uh, this underlying price for the, for the, the changing, in, uh, affecting lots of other instruments of the other options, and you want to you actually match against other people which are too slow. That's an opportunity to, 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 to make money. And people build, you know, purpose build system uh, to, to do that. Uh, so metrics you people would take uh, track is uh, you know, how often are you able to, uh, whenever, so hitting rate when you place an aggressive order, how often do you actually manage to get the liquidity? Did someone make it? Because if someone makes it to the matching engine before you do, they will get matched and that liquidity will disappear. So, yeah, it's first the first one that makes it uh, win. So you keep track of, uh, you know, uh, do I get 30%, 50% of all of my orders, uh, or if I get uh, you know, 5%, that means that I'm, I'm just not fast enough. Uh, so then it comes to measuring time. Uh, so the, the, the metric uh, most people use for latency, which is the best, in my opinion, is to measure on the wire. Uh, because you see people measuring in software, but it doesn't really mean anything because there's so much stuff going on at the operating system level and the network stack, which is where most of the time is actually spent. So it's better to have a neutral way of measuring stuff happening in and out of the network. So you can do that by uh, packet capture, uh, where you, uh, either you have a, a mirror in, in your switch or you have a tap. Uh, that allows you to uh, duplicate the, tra the traffic and record it somewhere. And you can see exactly what happened. And then when you get to very low level, you, you worry about exactly how do I measure these things? Um, because it's very different if you do end of frame to end of frame to start of frame to start of frame, because the frame itself can be up to 1,500. And you send the data at 10 gigabit per second. That means that you would take 1.2 microseconds to send off the frame which is a lot of time uh, in uh, competitive trading. So you want to know exactly from which part of the, of the frame you're comparing. The thing that makes the most sense is from the start of the trigger, where the information is uh, in, in the input, you know, multicast UDP packet you receive, to the start of the TCP frame that you send to the order. That's, that's a la real latency of your system. And I guess, yeah, the, the next slide, I'm going to have some, uh, some uh, example of which numbers people are able to achieve. Um, so. If you have the full, that, that gives you the, the full system latency, uh, but that's a bit difficult when you are developing. You don't need to iterate a bit uh, more finely than that. Uh, so you, you, you might want to know to take some measurements at different stages. Uh, you want these things to be a very low, low, uh, low overhead. So typically you're going to use uh, RDTSC. You can use RDPMC, which is uh, performance counters, uh, to get some more detailed stats. Um, but you want things to be very low overhead if you do extra internal uh, measurements. Uh, also, you don't want to just, just look at you know the minimum, look at statistics, uh, you know the median, the 90th percentile, 99th percentile. Um, and uh, in my experience, uh, a lot of the, the system can needs to be deterministic, and you want 90, 90 percentile to always be fast. Uh, you don't want to have tails which are very slow. Um, because that's, that's, that's what happens with, uh, with the software, which is not very carefully optimized, is that you will have, yes, you can fairly easily get good, uh, you know, minimum performance, minimum latency, but then you have, uh, you know, some, some, uh, some corner cases which are really ridiculously slow, you know, milliseconds, whatever. So you really want to, to get rid of those um, because um, it's for you, you, you have some strategies which are processing uh, tens of thousands of messages per second, but in, the, in a day, they will only react 300 times, for example. There's only 300 significant events where you want to trade. And you need to make sure that those three events, 300 events, really 
count and you're not slow on them. Uh, so what does it mean you need to do when you build the software? You do, depends on how fast you really want to go. Um, essentially, I like to say that you, you're building a real-time system with uh, soft real-time constraints. I mean, you can, you can go hard as well, I guess, if you build, if you go into FPGA. But if we're talking about software, um, there's a bunch of things you, uh, that are very important that you need to do. So first thing, you don't want system calls that block, block in the sense suspending the thread. That shouldn't, you know, you want to eliminate that, ban it from, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the project entirely. Uh, you want some kind of real-time scheduling guarantees uh, on your threads, uh, making sure that uh, they run uh, and they don't get, uh, you know, some other thread takes over the, the, the core. So affinity pinning uh, is going to resolve that. Because um, you can say this, basically you take over the core. This is only my thread running on it now. Uh, time of synchronization, since you're not allowed to use system calls, uh, you might want to go log free because you still need to sync, you still have maybe, uh, you want to avoid multi threading, uh, but uh, still going to have a, a bunch of different threads that work together. So you want to synchronize them with log free. Even better, uh, further down the line, you want to wait free because uh, log free does not give you guarantees of how long it takes. You know, you can spin, you know, you have spin lock, you could spin indefinitely. Do all memory allocation, everything should be allocated up front. Uh, yeah, so do, first I said no, no system calls that, that suspend, then you can go even further, no system calls at all. That means you don't use the operating system pretty much, you don't use the kernel, just for initialization, and then you need to, you know, by directly use the network card yourself, uh, take over the PCI Express device, took, uh, took, uh, took over PCI Express to it. Uh, and uh, you want limited uh, divergence of the code flow, meaning uh, you want your know, like, data to be deterministic. And so I uh, think like branch prediction, for example, uh, the branch prediction is going to make the, the, the pass, which is the, taken the most often, the fastest. But that's not necessarily the pass you're interested in. You're interested in um, very rare events being fast. And it's better, so if you make the code, always go through the same path. So there's only one path uh, that you build in such a way that it handles all the cases. Well, like, or you, you just have one if at the end, stuff like that. <coughs> so that's, that's, you don't have to follow all of these constraints. They're kind of by order, I would say, of, you know, of, uh, of importance. Uh, but if you really want to build a very fast uh, uh, trading system, that's sort of the, the, the problems that we deal with. So I mean, it's usually in terms of, you can't use much of the operating system. You can't use many libraries. You have to do a lot of the things yourself. Um, since those are pretty strict, uh, requirements, uh, you know, it can be a problem on some, on some large projects. So you can decide that uh, you're going to have just special purpose systems, which are very simple, which are very fast. And then other system with relaxed uh, constraint coding standards, uh, which, uh, you know, are going to be slower. Uh, or, you know, you can build one platform that has everything, but uh, an approach, you know, to get started, maybe to have something uh, hybrid. Uh, then, so why do you, 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 you care about everything in the stack? Because everything has an important aspect, uh, put an impact on, on latency. So, you know, you, you're sending TCP packets, which are uh, over IP and Ethernet. So TCP itself, it's important to understand how it works. Uh, you know, establishing a TCP connection, you have, a, you have an handshake. Uh, then you have an ACK window, meaning you cannot send data uh, if, if you, know, you have a maximum window size and if the data has not been hacked, well, you cannot send more data, uh, you, you're blocked, right? And of course, you don't want to be blocked. So it's important to be able to manage the hack window so that it doesn't happen. Uh, you have, by default, use Linux, you're going to have an algo algorithm, meaning that you send packets, the packets don't actually go out. It will wait for a little bit of, uh, for an amount of time before they actually go out so that they can coalesce the data. Again, that's not something you want because you, you're trying to have the lowest latency. I mean, the data needs to go as quickly as possible. If you have retransmissions on the line, that's bad as well because that means that the exchange didn't get the data in the first time. Then IP, uh, you want to make sure you have the fastest route. You want to avoid fragmentation. Uh, make sure you have the correct MTU set, right? For example, uh, if you're in the cloud, I think you get a large MTU by default. If you go to the internet, that's going to cause problems. Uh, and then, you're, at Ethernet level, you're limited by the bandwidth. If you go 
very hardcore uh, PGA, you're going to also worry about the phase of Ethernet. You can only start Ethernet frame every seven nanoseconds. So if you want to save seven nanoseconds, you need to synchronize your phase. Uh, then, uh, so what, what, what happens, in, in, what are the solutions that we have uh, for us? So, uh, as I said, you, 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 at some point, you need to bypass the kernel entirely. And uh, you, there's a bunch of solutions to do that, but you want to, yeah, you, you, you were going to issue DMAs to the network card via PCI Express. Uh, you're not going to work with it with interrupts. You're going to be constantly polling to get the data. You know, you have a, a, a buffer, uh, which is a circular buffer, which is mapped in R3, that you constantly poll for new data. And if you're too slow to get the data, well, you just lose the packet, which is different from the, the model of, you know, you get an interrupt, uh, you know, the, the, the kernel gets triggered, uh, as, as to read the data. Uh, so you don't want to use in that mode if you want the latency. And then uh, you know, this, if you do that, you, you can send a Ethernet frames uh, over the, the PCI Express, but you still need to rebuild IP, TCP. And then usually you're going to do that in user land yourself instead of relying on the kernel, uh, which also gives you more freedom of doing TCP tricks, uh, which can be useful. There's a bunch of ready-made solutions uh, that you can buy. Uh, there is also, uh, uh, I don't know the, the, the name of the, of the current best performing. There are some uh, you know, public uh, benchmarks of what is the best performing solution for high frequency trading. Uh, but these, these were um, uh, the, 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 the classics. Uh, you can see the, both SolarFlare and Exablaze uh, were bought by other companies because they've been successful. Um, but they are ready-made solutions, which is, you know, you buy the card, they have a LD preload, uh, as a shared object that will emulate the uh, BSD socket API and it has everything for you. So that's one way you can do it. You just uh, purchase the solution and you're going to get pretty good stuff. Uh, or, you know, some, they have a low-level API sometimes that you can, you can get more performance out of, or you can roll out uh, your, your own. <clears throat> then, uh, so this is the idea of this, this, uh, this, this, this card, the build solution specific to high-frequency trading, uh, but you know, there is a need for uh, kernel bypass technology, and uh, <coughs> the uh, general uh, you know, world of uh, open-source Linux Let's try to come up with a standard solution that would work for a large variety of hardware, some kind of a standardized APIs. Um, so one approach is uh, DPDK, which is backed by Intel. Uh, Intel, uh, uh, at least, uh, uh, they support for a lot of their network cards. Um, and uh, it's a very large framework, uh, but which is designed for kernel bypass. Uh, and then uh, a new thing as well, which is not bypassing the kernel, but allowing you to work with the kernel more efficiently, is to use a new API, uh, IO Euring, uh, which is since 5.5 uh, or something like that, 5.4, uh, and then significantly in 6. So um, it's, it's a bit of a padding, uh, paradigm shift, because instead of uh, issuing proper system calls, you can actually issue operations to the kernel without having to switch into the kernel mode all the time. Uh, and that allows you to use the kernel much more efficiently. And I think that's the first time that you can uh, do a network operation in, in less than a microsecond uh, using the Linux kernel. So that's also one way uh, that you can uh, get good performance on Linux. So in terms of threading model, I think the threading model in, in that space, which are the, the most popular to get low latency, is uh, a model where you have very few threads you don't want to rely on the scheduler of the operating system. You only have a few threads which are pinned to cores and they are the only ones running and they, they constantly potentially spin. They, you know, they, they use a lot of energy, they're not very green. Uh, uh, but they basically they re-implement the, the kernel logic because you're gonna have your, your own cooperative model to manage the different tasks. And uh, in general, you, do, you don't want to do to a synchronization because that's expensive. So it's better to have a shared nothing model where every thread works so much independently. Um, me, well, I like to mostly communicate through queues. I think that's a very good, uh, safe concurrent, concurrent model is uh, you have uh, task queues. Where you, can, you can push uh, lambdas, you can push functions uh, to another thread, which eventually runs them. Uh, that's uh, the main, main pattern. Uh, and 
a pattern which has been quite popular as well, uh, which has been recently ma made uh, sort of officially supported by C++, uh, is uh, um, sec locks. Uh, so the, the new thing that enables this uh, in C++ is uh, atomic mem copy. But the idea is uh, you, um, on the writer side, it's weight free. So the writer just writes data uh, atomically. And then uh, the reader, uh, basically, it, it reads a sequence number before it starts reading and after it starts reading. If it's the same, it knows it hasn't been changed in between and otherwise it needs to spin. So the, the reader is potentially spinning independently. Uh, but the writer is not slowed down. So your main thread is going to be writing data. And if you have an external thread which is monitoring things or the sampling data, it's a good pattern that, uh, that people use. So now I mean, uh, yeah, I've got some, uh, some example of uh, the sort of latencies people are, are dealing with. So uh, I, I read an article not long ago that people were designed a new high performance HTTP server in Python which claim to have latency of 10 milliseconds. So uh, that's, that's, yeah, I guess if you buy normal software, 10 milliseconds is, is maybe what you would expect. Software which is not specifically designed to be low latency, especially in a language like, like Python. Like now, if you, if you really design something with real time in mind, uh, you, know, you want to be able to very quickly act uh, 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 as, you receive, as you receive saying respond back. Uh, you can get uh, about 100 microseconds. Then if you want to get three microseconds, I think you really need to optimize the software close to it li its limits. Uh, and at this, at this point, you're starting to have the diminishing returns because uh, since if you have an MTU size packet, it's 1.2 uh, just to get the data in, right? 1.2 microseconds. And our system is three microseconds. Uh, you, you can go down maybe to 1.5, but you know, you, you, your time will be better spent Moving to hardware at this point because you can you can you can start basically uh, reacting before the pack the packet is fully in right because since you have a synchronous programming language uh, as the data comes at 10 gigabits per second so it doesn't like the pack the package just that doesn't just materialize by magic it comes byte after byte so as you re receive each byte you can prepare what you're sending as well and then so that's when you move to FPGA land so FPGA I think the the fastest uh, ready-made solution you can purchase is, is advertising about 45 nanoseconds latency. Uh, and then, but you see in the market, you can reverse engineer. You know, people have built ASICs for this. Uh, they have built, uh, you know, even uh, work above and beyond. I guess they are using uh, uh, very novel technology, very novel practices. You know, maybe, you know, you run chips, uh, uh, very high frequencies to go beyond the 10 gigahertz barrier and stuff like that. And you can go below, below 10 nanoseconds. So it's really uh, a race to the bottom. Uh, you, some people spend a lot of resources getting that fast. It takes a lot of engineering to do. Especially if you go into FPGA and ASIC, it's a uh, long, uh, long, long project. Uh, but that's definitely something people do uh, in, in trading. Um, me, I tend to think one of them, you know, if you can do a bit of effort to design for, for, for real time uh, without you know, um, over-optimizing, I think it's kind of the sweet spot. There's still a lot of opportunity uh, if you can reach your speeds to make uh, a, very, a lot of good trades. Uh, and then, so now we're going to talk about uh, more on the data side. Um, so what kind of data you have. So you, it's a very, uh, data science type projects. You, you receive a lot of data every day. The exchanges, uh, some exchanges are open 24 seven. And as I said, the 10 thousand of updates per second sometimes. So uh, you, you know, there's a lot of data um, and you know, there's venues across the world, you know, there's trading, uh, uh, for me, I work in crypto. So uh, big trading in, uh, in Tokyo, there's big trading in Singapore, in Dublin, uh, in, uh, in Virginia, uh, everywhere. Uh, you need to record all that data uh, work with that data, analyze this data. So there's all the kind of, uh, how do we record the data? What formats we use? How do we do the analysis? Uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into that as well. Um, so uh, me, I, mean, I think, you know, given the size of the data, talking about potentially terabytes every day of data, uh, fairly big, not huge, but fairly big. Uh, uh, binary formats uh, make sense, you want things which are fairly well optimized for not taking too much space. I want to use compression. 
uh, and then to do uh, do uh, data sciences. Uh, what's convenient is uh, if uh, it's also uh, kind of arrow based. Uh, sorry, it's um, column based with arrow. You can you can do that. So if it's column based, uh, you can more efficiently vectorize the operation, the numerical computing type things. So uh, yes, I think one, one good solution for that is, is the Arrow, uh, so the Arrow framework, which is a C++ uh, library with bindings to all languages. Um, it's now the, the base of Pandas in Python, so uh, kind of fits nicely, uh, nicely with it. But of course, you know, you could uh, could use uh, different kind of things. So uh, yeah, you can use Bison, but then uh, it's a bit verbose because you, every message is self-describing. You have no schema, but that's also potentially convenient. You can use flat buffers or SBE like we saw that the exchanges use, uh, which are schema based, so the, the, it's more efficient. They're going to be more com more uh, more uh, more compact. Uh, those are formats that you represent the value, uh, you know, record by record, you know, message by message. And if if you transpose it and you do it uh, column by column, then you can better compress it as well because you can compress uh, a given column. Uh, might not not all the values can change uh, in a, in each uh, new record. Uh, and anyway, also, if you, if you are constantly recording that information, you have the problem of resilience, making sure that if your system crashes, you know, you still have data to work with. Um, so uh, I know the, our IPC specifically uh, deals with this. Parquet does not deal with that. Uh, then in other things you might record, there's all kinds of metrics. Uh, so talking about, with, uh, met for example, this SecLock system I mentioned, it's a good thing to, to uh, use to get metrics. A uh, good solution people use is Prometheus, Grafana, this kind of ecosystem is nice for metrics. Because uh, everything, yeah, you, you essentially, you, you're running an operation, you, you're building software, which is then in production, and uh, means potentially to run 24-7, you need all kind of monitoring, alert systems, and all that. Uh, so uh, that's an important part of, uh, of the system as well. Uh, but you want to do all this recording as well without affecting latency. That's an important uh, concern. Uh, then, in terms of of, uh, of databases and, and, and languages, uh, people work with all kinds of things. Uh, I think uh, uh, people tend to not, not do the, the research in C++. Uh, they, they might do the the C++ is nice to, nice to actually write the code that does a simulation. But when it comes to looking at the data, understanding the data, it's nice to have some kind of uh, REPL, some kind of interactive environment. Uh, so uh, some people use MATLAB. Uh, which you know, uh, maybe a bit, uh, bit old-fashioned. Uh, R, which is a good language for for stats. But I think Python with pandas uh, tends to be now the, the 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 standard for everything to do with uh, uh, with uh, time series. And you have a bunch of different uh, databases as well. So you could use uh, the flat files. You can use Spark, uh, KDB uh, with a Q language. Is also is is a uh, it's a, it's a product which is a bit expensive, but I think it's, a, it's very efficient. It's got a very nice C API to integrate with. It's very well engineered, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, a bit of a uh, you know isolated environment um, where Python is big open source, but everybody uses it. Uh, yeah, you might need to parallelize, and then it's a problem of uh, also like kind of DevOps. How can you automatically spin up large uh, uh, research clusters uh, to be able to process all this data on demand? So uh, when we, we look at, uh, at, at research, basically we, we have all this data that we record about what's happening on the market. We have different models that we built. And what we're trying to do is uh, assess uh, whether the different models actually are good. Are they able to predict the future? Are they systematically biased? Because you know, the, the goal is, if your strategy is you, know, you want to buy and sell, you don't want to be at something which makes you systematically buy. Um, uh, so then, you know, you want to be able to, to run markouts uh, and also potentially iterate on many different types of combinations of, of models, uh, different parameters of the models, the different blends of models. And then for the execution part, when you're trying to figure out how should I place my orders such that uh, I can get, um, uh, you know, I, I place passive orders, but I want them to be, um, to have the best priority. Uh, you want to simulate what would have happened, you know, if you had placed your order, do you, do you place at the right event? Are you able to proactively manage it? You also have bandwidth cons uh, concerns, uh, latency concerns, how long it takes for the order to make it to the exchange. 
So all that kind of thing is going to be driven by, by simulation. Uh, so how do you, building simulation is also a task that you, we're going to do uh, uh, in C++, where you, you replay all of the data, and uh, you run, uh, you run uh, your, your, your strategy, your execution strategy, and you will try to figure out when it would have been, uh, would have been filled, the execution would have been executed uh, if we had placed those orders in the market on, on that day. So of course, you know, you're replaying historical data. Uh, in, in real life, if you place orders, people are going to react to that. But you know, historical data is fixed in, in time. Uh, so it, it, is, it is limited in its capabilities. Uh, but it's a nice tool if you want to, um, to be able to assess the quality uh, of, a, of a strategy. Uh, yeah, you, a problem as well is to probably, properly mod model the, the delay, how long it takes when you send a, an order before it makes it to the order book. Then your network simulation is a big thing, especially if you're doing uh, FPGA strategies, because that's the only way you can test them. Uh, but the way you're going to build is uh, you can build this, uh, a full instrumented network uh, where you replay everything and you re-implement the exchange based on historical data. So it behaves exactly with the same protocol, everything. And you can run your production setup, the same binaries, the same hardware against it. And you can see how it performs. Uh, so uh, you can measure how fast it is. You can measure what trades it makes. Uh, so that's a very good tool to iterate uh, on the code. And finally, uh, uh, as I mentioned, when, when you, uh, you have so many different parameters, so many knobs in the trading system, uh, what we a tool we use a lot is uh, figure out what are the best parameters, the best combinations that works best. And then, so that is, uh, you try uh, all the combinations and uh, you have a metric that uh, tracks the way they perform uh, and you iterate until you find it. So you, you run, run a big black box optimization, which is quite uh, compute intensive, uh, but which allows you to, to find, uh, you know, the, the, the best, parameter, best parameterization of your system. And uh, that's it. So I, I hope that uh, I, I shed some light on uh, the mysterious uh, world of uh, high frequency trading. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it was not uh, that uh, C++, but uh, I think C++ is definitely very relevant to most of the things I talked about. Are there any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're working with latencies on the network and in the software, but the database itself, uh, you have to access that. I assume, how do you work out the, the running average price? You've got millions of transactions coming in, uh, and you're working with latencies of like, sounded like sub nanoseconds. Uh, there seems to be a mismatch between that latency and the actual way you're going to calculate the overall market price. Yeah, so we, you have control on uh, how fast your, your system is. You can make it very fast, but of course, yeah, you, you, the system you interact with, the, the exchange you trade on, is potentially uh, very slow and non-deterministic, and that's also something that you you need to assess by yourself. Uh, so, based on, on your own uh, your own trading data, uh, you can see uh, the exchange will provide you timestamps of when everything happened. Some some will be more detailed than others. Some of them might tell you for how long your your uh, your message was, packed, uh, was queued for before they could process it. Some won't tell you that, that kind of detail, but you can sort of see um, uh, based on your own measurement, based on your own measurement of time, you know, you know when the, the, you send the data, you know when, when they, they reply back, you can try to model the behavior, uh, how, do they are, how, how much slower do they get as, as, as they get loaded. Uh, and modeling that correctly is also part I guess of uh, of the job, so that you can you can predict uh, how long it would take you to uh, to get there. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, thank you very much. It's absolutely brilliant. I've actually got two questions. Um, so, firstly, you mentioned the sort of the kernel circumvention techniques that you were using, so like DPDK and the Linux I/O you ring. Um, could you comment on? Uh, the direction that you think the industry is heading in? Is it going more towards the sort of DPDK strategy or do you think, you know, perhaps using the IOU ring? Um, have you got any, any insight into that? No, well, I think everybody was, um, uh, 
what's serious about this is using special hardware that they do in-house. Uh, so they're not using any of the shared solutions. Uh, I think the off the shelf solutions are more of a way to bridge the world of, uh, with other things because this, this kind of thing is also useful if you do your uh, supercomputing, machine learning, anything where you can reduce latency of the network is, is, a, is a good thing for all kinds of applications. Uh, but I think people which are really trying to push things to the, to the limit are going to be using special specialized solutions. I think solutions like DPDK and um, IU Uring are more for, uh, you know, uh, Maybe uh, structures which are a bit uh, in, in an intermediary state where they want things to be fast, but uh, they don't necessarily try to compete with the fastest uh, participants. Um, or if you are um, uh, in, in the cloud as well, uh, if you uh, want to trade in the cloud, which proper, you don't really have access to custom hardware, and that's, that's a way to leverage uh, the, the, uh, what you get uh, in AWS or somewhere else. I know AWS has DPDK integration. So that would be one way. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the other thing I was going to ask as well, sorry, um, you mentioned there were you know a couple of times about you know sort of the TCP uh, interactions and in, like the UDP multicast that was coming from the um, the exchange and sort of arriving at uh, you know sort of bringing information basically to all of the um, you know the the traders. Or, uh, so it, in in terms of you know because um, what I'm kind of interested in is. Are there any sort of semantics or enhancements that are, are implemented on top of the raw TCP, raw UDP that, you know, or, or is it just a case, because you mentioned, you know, um, obviously UDP packets can arrive out of order, they can get lost. Um, so that would potentially, you know, disadvantage some traders or, um, you know, is there anything sort of on top of the, you know, you know so any special semantics or is it just the case that it's, you know, the, the raw networking is is, you know, what is provided? Well, I think TCP is, is inherently unicast, right? It's, it's uh, point to point. Uh, they don't really have a way. Uh, you have to build that on top. I guess you could, do, uh, you could do a kind of mesh network using peer-to-peer uh, -peer technologies to kind of build, relay the information more efficiently over TCP. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, it's, a, it's a technology which is built for point to point. Uh, it's just, I guess, because um, the, yeah, it's, it's so popular, you know, it's become the... the, the, the by default, uh, set up to do networking. Also, it's much simpler to, to configure and set up. Uh, multicast is convenient when you are in a data center where everybody next to each other, everybody is on the same network. Same, uh, you know, if you're going over the internet, it becomes much more difficult to deploy this sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, I guess it's just yeah, different depending on how you access it, you will have different uh, technology available. I'm not aware of any particularly new protocol designed to solve those problems, but. Uh, Maybe there are. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Hello. Oh, yes, it's working. Uh, yeah, this is a very C++ -y question. Um, you mentioned avoiding memory allocation. So, would you advocate uh, custom allocators or custom containers? I mean, how would you avoid you know going to the heap when you've got millions of orders flooding in through the trading day? Well, so you, you can use uh, simple things like like uh, like a vector, so long as you you size it ahead of time. You know, same with strings. I guess you can you know make sure that you already have the capacity ahead of time. Um, but in, in practice, me, I, I use a lot of uh, intrusive data structures, where um, the data structures themselves don't do any allocations. Right. So uh, you have within the object, for example, you have a linked list. Within the object, you have. Uh, pointer to previous and next node. And so the, when you add it into an intrusive list, it's simply moving around the pointers. Uh, and it's up to you to manage the allocation uh, externally. And then you can just allocate, uh, you know, a bunch, you have a memory pool to allocate your objects. And then after that, uh, you can, uh, you know, link them up any way you want with intrusive data structures. Uh, be one way. But in general, if, if you have any kind of array, same if you have a hash map, uh, uh, you know, uh, open addressing hash map, you know, just make sure you allocate the buckets ahead of time. Uh, what you don't want is on the odd pass, actually, you know, uh, we need to resize a string now. Uh, you know, you want to send a, a message, uh, you send a message to place an order. Uh, you know, you, you want the buffer to be already ready. You just need to fill in uh, the price and you're good to go. Uh, if you have to, uh, you know, allocate uh, the string, uh, resize it a billion times, it's not going to perform very well. Is that it?
Well, thank you very much.